Hello, my name is Bob McElrath, and I'm proud to be the president of your union. I want to talk with you about some things that we can do to win a good contract in 2008. When you watch the Eye of the Storm video that's coming up, you'll see what happened in our last contract fight. One thing you'll notice is that the ILWU stuck together. We may have different jobs, we might work at different ports, and belong to different locals, but none of that really matters because the power of this union comes from the rank and file members. And when we stick together, there's nothing that we can't accomplish, under pressure or under stress. We have to stand together and stay united. And that's where our strategy starts for 2008. Another part of our strategy about winning is getting the public support. Our employers are thinking about how to win that also. That's one reason they locked us out and shut down the ports. They thought they had enough public support to go after our union. They made a big mistake, but they'll be back. And they'll keep trying to win public support with their issues. But we aren't going to respond to their issues and their game plan. We have our own strategy for winning public support, and it comes down to this. We have to talk about things the public understands and the issues they really care about. Things that are getting harder because most people don't have a union anymore. The public doesn't understand contracts or maintenance of benefits. Their health insurance isn't as good as ours, if they even have any at all. And most workers make a lot less than we do. It's not right, but that's how it is. The companies will try to use this and turn the public against us. We can't let that happen. Our message has to be positive. We have to make it easy for the public to understand. We have to explain that 2008 is about good jobs for our communities. 2008 is about fighting for cleaner air on the docks and cleaner air for our kids in the neighborhoods. We will win public support if we explain things this way. Another part of our strategy is showing the employers that we're ready to take action. And I'll be sending that message from the negotiating table. But the message will be even stronger if it comes from you, the rank and file. They need to hear from us on the docks and at the bargaining table. Finally, we have to be honest about how much politics plays in a part of our contract struggle. In 2002, the employers used their friends in the White House to attack our union. They tried to go after us with legal and political threats. Some of it was done behind the scenes, some of it was done in the news media. But it just shows how much politics is a part of our contract fight. You know the employers are already talking to their friends in the White House, so let's keep talking with our political friends. Politicians have to understand. Our fight for good jobs and cleaner ports affects the whole community. So let's keep talking to our friends at the city councils, our friends on the county commissions, and to your state reps and members of Congress, because politicians have to realize that this is a two-way street. They can't just show up when it's election time. They need to be with us whenever we're fighting for working families, for good jobs, safer ports, and better contracts. It has to be a two-way street. That means we have to take politics more seriously also. All of us have to sign up for the Political Action Fund because politics will be a part of this contract fight. And the Political Action Fund is how we make our voices heard in the political world. That's part of our plan for winning a better contract in 2008. It's about showing the employers we're organized and ready for action. It's about staying united and standing together, winning public support and building coalitions in the community making politicians more accountable and getting their support. So now, let's watch Eye of the Storm and let's see what happened the last time so we can be better prepared to win in 2008. Thank you. It's a log jam of monumental proportions. 200 cargo ships carrying half a million containers stacked up like buoys out to sea. All the major ports on the west coast are shut down. The shipping companies have locked out the dock workers who belong to the Longshoremen's Union. Our decisions had to be right. We were in a position where if we made a bad decision or we made the wrong decision, we were in, we had our backs against the wall that we were going to pay a heavy price. We knew they were going to come. We knew they were going to fight. How? You know, we didn't know. This shutdown is critical not only for the American economy, but for every country in the Pacific that ships goods in and out of the West Coast. There was so much at stake for each organization. People are wondering, you know, you know, when Mike Tyson was the king, king of the heavyweight division, you know, 
can, how, how many opponents can these guys hold off? Business owners say if some kind of agreement isn't reached soon, President no Bush should step in. Thank you. What he has to do is to decide. From Coast Ports along the West, it's not about I met with my son and my daughter, and I told him, this could be the one, and you know what your dad's going to do, and I just want to let you know how far I'm going to go. Because it wasn't just about me. It wasn't just about these healthy young people that you see at the hall getting a job every day. It was a bigger picture. Earlier today, more than 1,000 dock workers marched through San Pedro. We're looking for, in this set of bargaining, our jobs. Jobs that remain in the industry, jobs that are ours under the contract, and the employees have got to step up to the table. That partly at least ensures the involvement of the mediator on all issues. We did not want it that partly. We wanted a contract. We're very sorry it came. The crisis in our western ports is hurting the economy. It is hurting the security of our country. And the federal government must act. Without a doubt, the year 2002 was a difficult one for America. Reeling from the September 11, 2001 tragedy, the economy was in a dive, war raged in Afghanistan, and a feeling of fear prevailed over everything. Fear of the unknown, fear of the future, fear that maybe things would get worse before they got better. Two thousand and two was also the year that the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, the ILWU, would be negotiating their contract with the Pacific Maritime Association, or PMA, which represented the shipping companies and the terminal operators that the longshoremen worked for. It somewhat opened up uh, as normal, so-called normal negotiations. We didn't know what magnitude, you know, this thing was going to go. It's like going into a ball game. You know, you got butterflies. What's going to happen? And what type of a document are they going to hand you? And you're going to hand them your document. Middle ground was always our goal. I mean, we came into negotiations uh, along with the Coast Committee always uh, with the thinking that we want a contract. In order to achieve change. In, in this industry, it's going to take a long time. Uh, the, this is a very, very powerful union, and people recognize that. Joseph Miniacci was hired by the PMA to take over as president and CEO in 1996. He had no background in the shipping industry, his expertise was in labor management relations. Knowing that Miniachi was coming to the table and knowing that uh, Miniachi was vowing to tame the ILW and to change this industry, we knew and I knew that I had to get our, our uh, particular negotiating team ready. Was this particular generation of rank and filers hadn't been in a big fight uh, since 1971. And so many, many were new and many were young, which is why we made the big educational efforts. And we knew, and I knew, that Miniachi was going to play a heavy hand. And he was coming in with a very heavy no, uh, especially around our welfare package and our pension package. He said uh, we, he, that we could bite, fight, scratch, and claw, that we were not going to win this one. They were extremely uh, distrustful of each other. They realized that any wrong move on either party's part could negatively impact the future of either organization. Well, the union's always been in the background in my life. I'm a third generation longshore son. I've been in love with the waterfront since I was a kid. I used to come to the jobs with my dad to tie up ships and let go ships. And I grew up 
in a, in a union town. A union was in my blood. I got out of high school in 1969, went right on the docks with my dad and started working. If I knew I was destined for the waterfront. <laughs> it was my backyard. The ILWU PMA contract traditionally gets negotiated every three years. The structure and process of these contract negotiations are steeped in a rich and complex history dating back for generations. A longshore work uh, in the 1920s and the early 1930s was uh, handling brake bulk cargo. This is dirty work. It's dangerous work. Dealing with hides, sacks, coffee beans, 100, 150 pound sacks. It's very tough. The jobs were not rotated. Favoritism was the rule of the day. Uh, you had to come down to the waterfront. You physically appeared, and you were picked. It was called the shape-up system. Are you seen the old Marlon Brando film on the waterfront? Employer comes out and uh, says, I'll pick you, you, you. And this was one of the most important objectives of the early attempts at unionization was to break the company union, was to break the shape-up system. The workers wanted rights, so they fought, and the people died. Rioting workers armed themselves with clubs to fight off police. Clouds of gun smoke and tear gas filled the waterfront. When they cleared on July 5th, two men were dead, 85 injured. They still call it Bloody Thursday. July 5th, 1934. This was such a marking event. You can't go to an ILWU meeting without hearing the men of 34, the 34 strike, the great strike. It was out of this tragedy and the extraordinary outpouring of public support that a new labor movement was born with a new type of labor leader. His name was Harry Bridges. I'm an officer of a left-wing trade union, and that's the way those people think, and as long as my rank and file feel that way, my job is to represent them that way. Harry was way ahead of his time when he had a vision as to how the union should run, when he had a vision as to how people should be paid and what should be taken care of in the working conditions. It's like building an old house. He built the house, he built the union with the foundation that you can't rock. understood back in 34 that in order to be successful we had to have the same conditions from Bellingham to San Diego. And I think uh, we're one of the last uh, stevedores that still have physical dispatch halls. The main interest of the hiring hall and for the union is that it's a gathering place. It's, it's where workers come together. You pick your job where you want to go, what category you want to work. When you and I didn't get along yesterday at work, we get over it today because we have to talk about it. Crane drivers. West Coast ports support over 4 million jobs, representing 7% of the nation's gross national product, amounting to $300 billion worth of cargo loaded and unloaded annually. That is correct. You have to go back to the ILW, what we're all about, not only as a worker, but proud to be in this industry. And the way the government's attacking unions and the way the unions have gone from a 30% down to 11 or 12% of the United States, we're being challenged. Through all the uh, manufacturing jobs that have gradually uh, been outsourced, it all sort of made sense where everything was going. Global trade agreements were running, running the world, you know, and we were smack dab right in the middle of it. The two major issues in the 2002 negotiations were benefits and new technology. The PMA wanted to cut the medical benefits and introduced new technology 
in ways that would not only replace union jobs, but allow them to outsource remaining ones. The union knew that our issues was technology, and they tried to keep us off of that subject as long as they could. In seven years, we will, we will be gridlocked on our ports if we operate the way we operate today. There had always been a policy between the union and the employer that we keep what happens at negotiations at negotiations. And Miniachi very skillfully crafted this West Coast Waterfront Coalition as his alter ego. Founded just months prior to the negotiations, the West Coast Waterfront Coalition was comprised of some of the world's most powerful retailers like Walmart, Target, Home Depot, Best Buy, and Payless Shoes. This was a group of uh, shippers that had gotten together to uh, discuss the possible ramifications of action in 2002. Uh, PMA was one of the prime funders of this. The technology is already in place at Singapore's Passer Panjang ship terminal. One computer worker there does the same job as four longshoremen in Southern California. Digital cameras record a truck's license plate, container number, and weight within seconds. But at West Coast ports, workers with clipboards do it by hand. Container number. Pull forward. Within the ILWU, there are three general job categories. Longshore workers physically move the cargo, marine clerks track and document its movement, and the foreman oversees it all. Much of the discussion of new technology directly impact the clerks. We, we work with computers out in the industry for 10 to 12 years now, 15 years. Where are you guys working in the yard right now? Technology that the employers were after and that the industry was moving towards was was the electronic technology that's out there today. The communication network that the world was working with. Hey, technology's here. If they want to introduce it, the employers got to take us along. If they ain't leaving us behind, they're going to take us along. We heard more than once, why don't we just pay you guys, get you out of here, and we'll run the, and, you know, we'll run the waterfront. I told Miniachi straight across the table that uh, these are jobs, are, the jobs are not for sale, that we're ready to, to meet changes in the industry but we're not gonna give up our right to our jurisdictions. The reason the buyout offer was such an insult to the IOWU dates back to 1960, when the IOWU and PMA signed a very key contract known as the Mechanization and Modernization Agreement, or the m, &M. Traditionally, most longshore work consisted of unloading cargo from pallets, boxes, and sacks. But over the years, large uniform containers were being introduced, which would eventually revolutionize the entire shipping industry. The Mechanization and Modernization Agreement of 1959 put into place the right for the employers to move forward with technology. The rule was this, that if a job is eliminated by technology, we're out of luck. But if there was any work left to be done, it was ours. Negotiations comes down to money. If it wasn't for the money, I guess why would we all be here? We wouldn't be here. It comes down to money, but then it comes down to their control. They want to be a controlling factor over the workforce. Back in 34, when, when, when the strike hit and people were killed and we formed our contracts in, in those years, 34 and 35, uh, we did it for conditions, and those are the conditions that prevail today. You see it in every day's bargaining. The newspapers have got it. Workers are without medical, 40 million people in this country are without medical. How do we maintain our medical package, which was a state-of-the-art medical package? Great package. You could make $100 an hour if you didn't have any medical benefits. One catastrophe would completely wipe you out. It's a fundamental issue. It goes back to as long as I've been active in the, in the division, uh, it's always been going into the contract, there's one identified strike issue and that's MOB, a maintenance of benefits. And there is a lot of uh, pressure, a lot of pride uh, that, that, that not on my watch. In other words, we're not going to lose this on my watch. And the people that were in those negotiations and that stuff were intent 
on not losing benefits on their watch. Maintenance of benefits was something that uh, we had to have, and it was sort of a foundation benchmark for us, and, and that's in, in bargaining and for myself to achieve so that I could set the tone for the rest of bargaining. My belief is that this was a strategy to drag us as long as we could to, to the deadline of, uh, of the contract and have no time to talk about uh, the uh, technology issue. They wanted us to change our network provider to a specific provider that we had no prior opportunity to look at and decide whether or not that was a good direction for us to go. Uh, we agreed with them to put out a request for a proposal and see if, there, if this provider or any other provider was better. We went to the employer with that in mind, that, that, that we weren't being unreasonable, that, that we understood what the cost of medical care was. So that's the kind of, you might call it a compromise, but that's the kind of thinking that we tried to, to work through the negotiations with. So it wasn't a thing that we were uh, just saying no to everything. Put the bed, second priority was our pension. So I immediately then started negotiating into our, pa our pension package, uh, Miniachi. Uh, it was understood then that Miniachi with us that uh, he would not move into our pension package without us committing to negotiating into technology. But the employers uh, thought that they needed something different or additional and uh, one of the things involved in that is is uh, security and security is pensions. I mean we, we needed to have some security in, in where we're going. The union rejected the shippers' latest contract offer, which the shippers contend would make longshoremen the highest paid blue collar workers in the nation. Uh, we were being touted as the most highly paid blue collar workers in America, and we're not even number five. We weren't even number five at the time in the city of Seattle. But, but the point is, so what? Uh, so what, is, there, is there something wrong with a blue collar worker being highly paid? especially in our industry. The cost of shipping a container of goods overseas to pay for all the cost of unloading that is 1% of the total cost and less of shipping that container would cover our wages, just 1%. We built this industry for the employers, you know. We, we feel our workforce has honed its skills and we're second to none. You make money for these guys, but they get to this point, they think they don't need you anymore or they can outsource it. As negotiations continued and both sides dug in their heels, the ILWU received a very interesting phone call. We were, a matter of fact, in uh, Jim Spinoza's office, and <laughs> all of a sudden uh, the receptionist uh, put a call in and everybody came running down and Tom Ridge was on the phone. We were actually uh, in session when Tom Ridge called. And Tom Ridge was very adamant about uh, where these negotiations, very adamant in his position that uh, we were not to find ourselves moving into a strike situation or anything that would hurt this country or the economy of this country that we would be deemed, and he said it himself, that we would be deemed to be looked upon as economic terrorists. We had calls from uh, Tom Ridge. We had calls from Elaine Chow. We had calls from the, the Solicitor General Scalia. And we had a visit by our Department of Labor attorney, Andrew Siff. Andrew Siff, on behalf of the White House, had said that he was a part of uh, what he referred to as a White House task force on the West Coast PMA-ILW negotiations. He said that the folks at, at the White House and this task force were, de were determined to intervene. There aren't too many unions anymore they really have national economic significance. Uh, they do, because they control all of the goods that go in and out of the West Coast ports of the United States. And uh, they are pretty unique as far as the uh, economic impact they can have on the country. So it's something that we got engaged in pretty early and developed a plan on how we would handle it if the feared worst case scenario were to happen. He then started sort of ratcheting up the different consequences that would hit the union if they didn't settle. And they seem to be trapped in their own little world 
um, that left them incapable of kind of understanding how the broader world outside of their little end of the far end of the spectrum viewed things. He started talking about um, the um, military coming in and taking over the work in order to secure the docks and keep it secure. I would challenge Sif at different times and say, look, you know, you're just, uh, these are empty threats. Uh, we don't believe for a minute that the government would do these extreme measures like this because you have no reason to. And he turns around in our conversations and says, yeah, but we do have a reason. He said, what is it, Andrew? He says, well, the reason is we're going to war in Iraq. What was really amazing is that Andrew Sif was telling me about the plans to go to war uh, in Iraq back in June and July of 2002, almost a year before they uh, went to war. They had made a decision, according to the information we were receiving, that they were determined to make war in Iraq. The negotiating team is stuck. They don't know what to do, where to go. They call a special meeting of the caucus. And they discuss the situation. The caucus decides that there's nothing else they can do except go public with the threats, that it's time to end the press blackout. We needed some leverage in the game. We had to. We had to go to and, and meet this challenge of the outside world. All right, now we've got to get outside of our little door of our gates that we normally live in, in this little bubble that we lived in where nobody knew anything about us. And now that we've been exposed, now we have to take that exposure and we're going to have to tell them very loudly who we are. <laughs> Realizing the ILWU needed help, the AFL-CIO offered their resources and support. They had to know uh, that they weren't in this thing alone. They had to know that the rest of the labor movement was going to support them no matter what it took. Here's what I believe about the American public. I, I think they're innately fair, that they listen to stuff. If they only get one side, they get schnookered. They also got the attention of the government and the people in the United States and around the world. And I think that was their motive. In an effort to get the merchandise moving at the docks, the White House is under increasing pressure to intervene. We mobilized our support. We mobilized our rank and file and all the political support we had. And we had what we called the Bush butt out rallies. Hundreds of longshoremen marched down California. Dock workers sent a message to President Bush to butt out. It appears as if the White House is just waiting to stick its nose into this dispute. We had to find our own way to get our message out using our own voice. We had to find a way for our people to say what was their position. The human face of an ILWU worker became the next door neighbor, so to speak, for most people. And that, more than anything else, changed the attitude because now you are not talking about some mythical person in a white hat with a hook uh, look like they were from uh, one of the movies, uh, but rather you were talking about someone who was uh, a little league coach, someone who was a member of the choir uh, on the Sundays. There was 30 different protests in 30 different cities across this country. This is something that, that quite possibly could make or break the labor movement. Well, I'm with the Machinist Union. We're, we're in uh, negotiations now with the Boeing Company. And, uh, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways we face a very, uh, fundamentally, a very s a similar situation. And really, a movement was beginning to develop domestically and internationally in defense of us. And it was really rewarding to say, hey, people still see us as important and credible in this labor movement and something that needs to be defended as part of a national treasure. Whether you work in a union or a non-union family, what it is you're trying to do benefits workers across this country. Power to the workers. Power to the workers. Power. 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 Oh 
the major ports on the west coast are shut down. From Seattle to San Diego and at every port between, hundreds of ships stacked with and containers. And more than 40 ships are now stranded off the coast of Long Beach. The hundreds shutdown will continue until the union agrees to either a temporary extension of its old contract or an entirely new deal. And the walkout on the waterfront has no end in sight. Well, basically, we showed up one morning and the uh, gates were locked and they said, you're not going in. And at that point, we're wondering what's going on. We don't believe we had a strike. No one voted for a strike, so we were just locked out. You know, my position was if whoever shuts down this waterfront is going to make the biggest mistake and bargain. Well, lockout was, a, was probably the toughest decision anybody is going to make, particularly in this industry, and it, it was not taken lightly at all. But you have to understand, though, that the lockout was in response to union actions. The union, in essence, was striking us. We have statistics from up and down the West Coast, from Seattle to San Diego, indicating production on the coast fell by 54% Sunday when we hope work would return to normal. The concept of a strike being, quote, good because it's American and a, quote, lockout being bad because employees are being deprived of work opportunity, to me, is totally fallacious. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is, both sides have to recognize that they can do economic harm to the other if an agreement is not reached. Now we warned them that if you don't stop the slowdowns, we will lock you out. The gates would say we didn't have the keys to those gates locks. Say we say have the keys. A slowdown is nothing more than a paid strike. What do we want? When do we want it? The Pacific Maritime Association, PMA, says it locked out 10,000 members of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union because they were slowing down cargo handling by as much as 90 percent. We are, as far as we're concerned, lying. And locally, a lot of people were confused in the community. They were either for you or they were against you. Uh, a lot of people thought we were out on strike. They didn't understand the difference between a lockout and a strike. Everybody was like, God, how, how long is this going to last? It can't last more than two days. And you know, here we were in, 10 days into it. All these men and women, all they wanted to do was go back to work. And they, you know, kind of didn't have a choice in the matter. And it was really, it was kind of surreal. Now there's rumors that the national guards come in to work the docks. No work equals no money. Equals pulling your kids out of colleges and losing houses. And all we wanted to do is keep our benefits and get the pension raises for our retirees and surviving spouses. Tell you, you look at the androids, you look at the world cops, you look at these people. They're the ones that are the talents. They're the ones that are bringing our economy down. It isn't the ILWU. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not a strike, this is a lockout, okay? And we, and we didn't lock the gate. They've been feeding the media piles of propaganda and fiction, saying we're against technology, where all we want is union jurisdiction. They're trying to use modern day McCarthyism to bury us. There's been a lot of confusion in the media, and even with this guy Bush, of what this union wants. We want a contract, but we're not stepping back. And we're not getting into concessionary bargaining to get one. Uh, collective bargaining is not a cerebral exercise. It's a contact sport. And that uh, when we talk about economic leverage, we're not talking about something theoretical. We're talking about something that's real. My message last night to the union, I think, was very, very simple. It's time that we put the interests of ourselves to the side and start thinking of the interests of the American people and let's open our ports. They said no. ILW members set records for cargo movements in West Coast ports in June, July, and August. As a consequence of the increased cargo volume, the number and severity of accidents on the job increased. In 2001, there was not one fatality involving longshore workers in West Coast ports. In 2002, there has been five to date, yet the ILWU is accused of a slowdown.
one of the thorniest issues for the ILWU negotiating committee, and one that came to symbolize the PMA's arrogance, was the whole discussion of safety on the docks. There's people getting crushed and killed all the time. During this 2002, we had six people, five or six people killed within a six, seven month period. In Tacoma, not too long ago, they had a young girl killed, crushed by a, a container. I was uh, run over by a 15 ton heister in the hole of a vessel. I was in the hospital for over four months and then finally on the fifth month, they had to amputate my leg below the knee. There you go. Thank you. I'm talking to the guy next to me. We're walking down the, um, the ramp back to the ship in the crosswalk. So I took three steps and then, like I said, bam, I was hit. Part of my body flew into the chassis. The other party ran over. And uh, they said I was just out. It is dangerous. And it's more dangerous now than it ever was because there used to be many more injuries and now there's more deaths. During bargaining for the safety committee, we were trying to achieve AEDs, artificial external defibrillators, to pump a guy's heart back up. The employer said, handed us a piece of paper that said, if we put an AED on every terminal on the West Coast, it would probably only save three guys' life over the life of a contract. So they didn't want to do it. At which point, to a man, our side of the committee stood up, called them a bunch of no good murderous bastards and walked out of the room. Things are changing. And they're not always for the best. We're in a time right now where it's, it's, it's a corporate time. And it's very frightening for me. Very frightening. It's a very serious, hard time right now. And I thank God that I am in the union. Oh, my God. There is perhaps a glimmer of hopeful news tonight. The union has agreed to meet with a federal mediator tomorrow morning. Responding to a formal request from Peter Herkin, the director of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, the ILWU and PMA agreed to meet with him. I remember walking up to the building and, you know, we were, we were still talking, uh, you know, how what our game plan would be. We were in the hallways and we were in a little meeting room amongst ourselves. And we seen these guys in the corner and, and you looked at them and right away they sort of hid their face and all of a sudden they, they had pieces on them, they had guns on them. Negotiations aimed at opening ports along the West Coast collapsed this afternoon when union officials stormed out, accusing the shipping companies of bringing armed bodyguards to the talks. We're not gonna tolerate that kind of bull. Uh, they believe that this was a violation of the culture of uh, their relationship. Uh, it was a suggestion that there could not be productive negotiations, and the union felt that uh, until the armed guards were removed, there could be no further negotiations. The people that put this together did a, did a tremendous job. They're and, and under very, very bad conditions. I mean, people have been killed trying to build this. Like I like to tell people when they ask me, they never gave us anything, the employers. Whatever we have, we took from them. And whatever we continue to have today, we are powerful enough to continue to hold. You have a situation now where, where before a giant retailer, you know, a Bloomingdale's or a Macy's, would have a huge uh, warehouse. Now all the giant retailers are moving to just-in-time inventories. So these companies have reduced their inventories, uh, taken that off their balance sheets. We've become an importing country. Uh, uh, I think from Maersk today, uh, I may have the numbers off, but I suspect 70% of our cargo comes through the West Coast ports. So the issue of, of, from an economic standpoint, of the importance of those ports and to the workers that, were, that manned those ports was, was extraordinary. Everything evolves around trade. And I think dock workers are strategically positioned to deal with globalization. Wherever you go in this world, we're different. Different languages, different people. But the thing that's so common is the ship. 
when it leaves America, it's the same ship when it gets to Japan or when it gets to Hong Kong. It's the same. The negative effects of globalization and the privatizations of ports in the world are coming to dock workers, and they're going to, uh, uh, you know, take us down notch by notch, or as we've seen throughout the world, if your union isn't strong enough, they'll just break you with one blow. Since we've seen uh, Thatcher started off in 89, uh, the Patrick Stevedore and the Australian government example in 1998 on the attack of the Maritime Union of Australia. The dispute widened last week, though, when Patrick Stevedores dismissed 1,400 workers and replaced them with non-union labor. Now we've seen it shift back to all of Europe with a European directive on self-handling, which will, will allow you know, uh, non-union workers or, or workers from developed countries to take unionized dock workers' jobs. dealing with the same corporate interests here, different governments, same corporate interests. You're seeing the importance, even more so than the past, of dock workers in the, as an essential element of that trade. And because we're important, because many of us have strong progressive and industrial histories, there is now an organised um, industrial and political conspiracy to weaken our ability to bargain, and particularly uh, weaken our ability to be able to effectively organise our members. When we go to to meet and have meetings with uh, our international, uh, International Transportation Federation and the IDC, the International Dockers Council. It's very imminent there that the attack from government and from privatizing through government activity is just knocking out and destroying workers throughout the world. We're fighting the same fight in Europe as the ILW on the US West Coast. And it's against those fierce attacks on dock workers' rights and, and the circumstances in the ports. Dockers around the world, more than any other time, have to come together. It's in solidarity of world solidarity of dockers that we stand here today to let you know that your struggle is our struggle. What happens to you happens to us, the ILWU. In the future, well, the future is ours. Today, seeing the communion entre organizaciones, esto es imparable. Esto es, creo que es un coche sin frenos en, en una bajada, no en una pendiente. Esto, lo importante y, y lo imprescindible es que los responsables sepamos conducir ese coche, que yo estoy convencido va a bajar a gran velocidad. Every politician and every union around the world had their eyes on the ILWU because they knew if the employers, Pacific Maritime Association, broke the International Longshoremen's Union, that was the end of unions as you and I know them. These workers did not strike. These workers were locked out. You have been right in this fight.
right. And from the very beginning, you wanted to work. It was PMA who locked you out and prevented you from doing your job. I sent a letter to President Bush expressing our deep opposition to his policies and his suggestions uh, in terms of deploying the National Guard and having the states call out the National Guard. We wanted the natural process to take place for them to have their day and to be able to communicate those issues and communicate them effectively. What we certainly didn't want is to have uh, national labor policy eroded by undue pressure from the White House. Joe Miniacci does not want to negotiate in San Francisco. The negotiations have been taking place back in Washington, D.C. He feels that he can legislate instead of negotiate. From Washington, we saw uh, that we needed to start doing things in a different way and become more energized and really enact a whole program for political action. The fact is, these are two very strong entities, and they're and they're terribly they're they're terribly important. But again, they had a history of being able to work their differences out. I was mobbed by members of Congress, many of them Democrats, saying we have to do something, we have to have federal intervention, we have to do this. After being contacted by the Coast Legislative Action Committee, Senator Ted Kennedy wrote a letter to President Bush, also signed by members of Congress, Feinstein, Murray, Wyden, and Miller, in a way, Akaka and Cantwell, stating we believe that any such intervention would be harmful to the swift resolution of this contract. Back at the negotiating table, things were going from wild to worse. Even with the help of federal mediators, there were knockdown, down drag-out fights over every word with no end in sight. We were pretty united and working pretty hard on a technology agreement on our side of the table. The employer was absolutely lost. If you had to credit why we were able to hang together while the employers were much, much, found themselves in a much more uh, frustrated situation than us because they were, they were battling like crazy. We knew in their house. The employer said it made 23 proposals on technology. Our committee had a difficult time dealing with that. But the clerks came back and agreed to 21 of the 23 proposals. And the employer walked away from it, all of them. When I think the difficulty that PMA had, and particularly Miniachi, because he had gone through one negotiation, was that the union correctly perceived that maybe he didn't have the backing behind his uh, ability to negotiate that contract. Again, Miniachi did not understand technology clearly did not understand the industry or how to get to where he was going. We were really thinking about our future rather than the present. We knew that the, we knew what the cost would be if we did not make the changes that we made to this contract. Miniachi's game plan was to do exactly uh, what he did earlier. He went to the outside. He was good at going to Washington. He was good at lobbying. He was good at defacing us in any way he could. Honesty and integrity dealing with people, whether it's across the bargaining table or in everyday life, you gotta have it or you lose it. It's not good. The lockout was beginning to collapse under its own weight. 12 days into it, the ILWU receives another surprise phone call. This time, directly from the office of the President of the United States. And I can remember exactly where we were standing because the phone call came that uh, the President had offered a cooling off period. And we're like, okay, that's good. And then the questions were, should we do it? Should we do it? They were asking us if we would extend the contract for 30 days. It was my position that, uh, and recommendation that we extend and we go along with that extension that we had nothing to lose at this point. I, I wonder what went through the government's head when PMA, they called PMA and their answer was no. Frankly, in 30 days, we knew that our leverage to shut the thing back down again would be gone. So 
if we would have conceded uh, to the government's request, uh, we felt that we would, have, we would have lost all of our leverage. I have determined that the current situ situation imperils our national health and safety. I have appointed a board of inquiry to investigate the issues at stake. Today, the board submitted an official report stating each party's position. I'm now directing Attorney General Ashcroft to seek an injunction under the Taft-Hartley Act, ending the lockout, and requiring work at the ports to resume at a normal pace. Our lead story today, just minutes old, and it is that President Bush has announced that his administration is stepping in to stop a days-old work stoppage on the West Coast. How is it the administration could be invoking Taft-Hartley when uh, the workers had offered to extend the contract uh, and the administration was on even on that side? Management said no. The president has not picked sides in this uh, dispute what he has what well, he has picked sides he's picked the sides of the American people he's concerned about the American workers and the American economy in the beginning of the struggle we had the passenger ships coming in and we worked the passenger ships for free not to impact the public with the military ships the PMA refused to work the military ships we said we'll work your military ships for free on our own time anything that our troops need we will load or unload free and they said no to that the work stoppage also threatens our national defense these ports load the ships that carry supplies to our men and women in uniform you tell me who truly supported troops and who didn't support troops by denying that offer it was all a scam federal mediators have been trying to get the workers for operators to resume operations while they negotiate their differences. This is the first time in the history of the United States that a president has ever let management lock workers out, create a phony crisis, have them reject his offer to go back to work for 30 days, and then issue a Taft-Hartley injunction putting the weight of the government behind the recalcitrant employers that have created this crisis. Are you saying that the Bush administration is in some sort of secret collusion with the uh, with secret, management? Not secret. And today is the crowning jewel of that. There was a time period when we all thought, and I personally became convinced, that we were going to lose this whole thing that the federal government was going to come down on the ILWU and the membership so hard. This was a battle to actually destroy the union. It wasn't, it wasn't over wages and hours and work conditions. This was a battle that they were actually trying to take this union out. I never thought in my lifetime that I'd be facing a legal problem of figuring out how to stop the military from taking over workers' jobs and, and imposing sort of martial law in a labor dispute. You look what's happening in the rest of the country outside of well-organized workplaces, families are being devastated. Their futures are being foreclosed. Their dreams are being dramatically limited because of the loss of pension benefits, the loss of health care, the loss of their hourly wages, uh, all of these things. You know, Harry always said, you know, you got to leave something for the ones coming. You got to make it better for them. And if, and if it all went south on our watch, God forbid. The thing that helped, it, that helped me to lead was that that rank and file, that disciplined rank and file that uh, just stood steadfast and uh, basically said to, to myself and to the committee, we're behind you. One of the things I used to uh, tell the employer when we'd side more is, uh, would you die for your organization? 
Not a chance. A lot of people on my side of the table would. Had the government tried to take over the docks, we'd had a war. We'd had an uprising of labor in the United States that you'd never seen before. Forced back to work by Taff Hartley, the ILW began preparing for what they were certain would come next. Every day, the PMA would send him a letter saying, they're, they're slowing down, they're violating the injunction, go after them. So we said, before you do that, you may want to take a real good look at the information we have, because you're going to be embarrassed when you go in. They tried to make a motion in court, and they failed. And they failed because of this counter information and this counter evidence that the union had collected. So that failed. Taff Hartley was nothing more for me than a cooling off period, and, and it's continued to negotiate. Miniachi thought Taff Hartley was going to be something that broke our spirit, something that he was going to I don't know, come away victorious in some way. I knew that I knew that I was going to get a package. I knew that I was going to able to get a contract, and I knew that I was going to get a good contract. We've struggled and fought for nine months to get that agreement, and we got it. We got three things: we got pension, we got welfare, and we got the clerks maintain the clerks' jobs. And they voted, the final vote was 13 to 1 to accept it and to take it to the caucus. To me, what I'm most proud of is there's still people that are working people that have a big measure of control over their destinies and are able to have working conditions and wages and benefits that everybody should have. I think when you look at what the ILW achieved, there's only one way to characterize it. That's a slam dunk win. It's a great moment for me and, and a great time in history for me to look back at when I, as, I, as I leave this uh, industry pretty soon. You know, in a few years, I'm in my senior years now, and I'll look back. And uh, these hard times were tough, but they're, they're just glorious times for me to remember. If I had, could do something different, it would be like I said, we did end up where we wanted to end up. And we could have done that without the destruction that we caused on both parties, ourselves, and, and the rest in the shippers and, and, and the economy. And you feel bad for that. Actually, uh, unions, they call each other brother and uh, sister. Since I was a little kid, they don't call me Ray. It's been brother. When I walk in the house, my dad's 84 years old, retired. He's making more money now than when he was working. Because we take care of our old timers. And when I walk in the house and they say, hey, brother, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just something that uh, it stays with you. Just, I've had, I have this made, it's the, it's the hook. That's like the altar of the whole waterfront. It just means everything. The ship is the altar, and the hook is the host. You know, I look at the, at the ILWU and the Longshore Division as kind of like uh, the old Roman Empire, in a way, facing the barbarians. You know, there's this, this precious, rare thing that they have take a big bite, <laughs> because if you, if you don't take that and hang on, you're going to get hungry down the road. We've got to keep our teeth sharp. That's for damn sure. Yeah.
My name is Glenn Burpee. I'm an Everett Longshoreman. I've been on the waterfront here since 1968. My name is Cecil, 9459. I'm uh, registration number 81726 out of Portland, Oregon. Local 7 in Bellingham, the northernmost port on the west coast. My name is Latasha. I'm 101009, local 10, Longshore. I'm from the Port of Anacortes, and this is my son, Tyler Wilkerson. Hi, I'm the... <laughs> Henry Graham, plug number 8100. We are Local 10, I-O-W-U. Wow. Yeah. Local 8, uh, 82,010. 62044 registration. Thank you.